Here we are. Yeah, so talk about water. And this is just one molecule, but it allows life to happen. We can't imagine life um, without water because we are so tied to water. Uh, actually, life evolved in water. The first life evolved in salt water. And look at us. We uh, were born surrounded by uh, amniotic fluid in water. And we are born, and then we have a real problem with losing water. So we have skin, we need to drink water constantly, our kidneys are conserving water. So we're mostly water, we hold this water, it's where the chemical reactions happen in our body. That's why in Mars we're looking so much for evidence of water to see uh, if there's evidence of life because they're so tied together. The life though as we know it. Oh, I gotta throw a lizard in here. This is uh, Lagarto Jesu Cristo, the Jesus Christ lizard, because it walks on water. Um, very common in Costa Rica. You'll see these guys run across the water. And uh, they do it because water has a surface tension. And they go very fast and they have scales that have little, um, that come out so they can really uh, push that water and stay on top of it. And they usually fall into, into the water and hide. But the surface tension is because water loves itself, because it's polar and it wants to stick its head to the butt of another water, the negative and positive ends. And so it has a surface tension. So you go out to a pond, you see these water striders, these bugs that live on the surface of water. Yeah. And think, if you drop an ant into water, it stops on the surface. You drop a penny, it goes in, right? It's just because it's heavier, but water has a surface tension on it. Um, yeah, because it keeps water sticks to itself because of those hydrogen bonds. We'll see all of these things about water make it really a unique molecule and suited to our life. So water cohesion, it sticks to itself. And two wet surfaces, think about two pieces of wet glass. They stick so hard to get apart because they stick together. It takes a lot of heat to boil water because it tends to stick to itself. And you've got to really crank up the energy to make the molecules move fast enough so they start boiling and they start turning into gaseous form. But man, they don't want to, they want to stick together. It's one of the few elements, uh, compounds, that is uh, lighter as a solid. So ice floats. Liquid water is heavier. It's weird. And then it's a great solvent for polar molecules, for uh, things like salts and things dissolve in water very well. <clears throat> So this cohesiveness, the way that it sticks together because of hydrogen bonding, allows us to have like this white pine I'm looking at is so tall. How does the water get from the ground way up there? And if you guys are work with pumps or anything, you know it takes a huge pump to move water against gravity. But here's a, a tree silently delivering water up 100 feet. You know, how does it do it? Well, the secret is you've got really narrow tubes. This is the xylem. And the water molecules are single file and they're stuck to each other. So as they evaporate from the top of the tree, it pulls up the next one eventually from the ground in a row and it delivers the water up to the top of this tall tree. And it allowed plants to evolve beyond moss when they got this vascular tissue to allow them to grow tall. I know you're probably thinking formally, yeah, what, what do we, this is really cool though. This is how water gets to the top of a tree. It's these narrow little columns and because they're stuck to each other. All right, you can tell. Uh, it's really pretty cool how this works. This heat capacity means that uh, you've, re you've really got to crank it up and you add salt to water, it changes it. Different uh, elevations you read on the box high elevation instructions, because yeah, it's, it's gonna depend. But normally uh, water molecules, they hydrogen bonds form, reform, form, break, form, break, form, break, form. And then uh, as you heat up the water, sometimes you get so much energy that the, it will leave as a gas, but normally it stays as this fluid. And water absorbs a lot of energy and holds a lot of energy. So if you walk across the beach in summer, oh my God, that water is so, the sand is so hot, right? But the water feels fine. So water is gonna absorb this energy and hold it. 
Yeah, and so things with a lot of water um, are going to be able to buffer big temperature fluctuations because they absorb, they hold heat and they release it. And really, when I lived before this was in uh, Missouri and Iowa, the middle of the country. And let me tell you, living in the middle of continents, the weather's the worst. You have the hottest summers and the coldest winters because bodies of water mitigate big fluctuations in temperature. So here in Maine, we have the coastal forecast and the inland forecast because the water will buffer these great big fluctuations. Even in winter, it's going to hold heat and release it and then absorb the heat in the summer. So uh, Mediterranean climates are beautiful. If you live near water, uh, you tend to have good um, um, temperatures. The middle of continents fluctuate quite a bit. Hey, and allows ice fishing because the only reason is because ice is lighter than water. And so the ice forms this crust at the surface actually insulates the water below from the cool air. If water was normal, you know, it would, the ice would go to the bottom of the lake and it would freeze from the bottom and you wouldn't be able to have fish living in the water beneath this insulating layer. So in freshwater lakes and ponds, especially up here in Maine, uh, you, uh, you have this cool ability of ice forming on the surface of ponds and lakes that is going to um, um, insulate below and allow life to live below it uh, while the top is frozen because um, solid water is less dense. And this is gonna show you why. As you cool it down, the molecules all line up head to butt, negative to positive, and it's gonna spread out in this lattice. Hot water, the hydrogen bonds are breaking and forming constantly and the molecules are closer together. So as water freezes, it forms this more of this lattice with lots of space in between it, and it makes it less dense. And then water is a great solvent. Um, you can see you add water to a bunch of salt, and the water molecules are going to surround the sodium and the chloride with different ends, right? Um, the chloride is going to be negative, so you're going to have the positive end of water surrounding it. And uh, the sodium is positive, you're going to have the negative end of water surrounding it, but it's going to dissolve that salt in the water and spread it out. So you're about water being the universal solvent. I mean, fats don't mix with it, but anything with a charge um, will mix with water beautifully because water will surround it and, and push it apart. Speaking of fats, yes. Things that are uh, hydrophilic means it loves water. Hydrophobic, fear of water, it doesn't like water. So compounds that are really important here are that fats are hydrophobic. And it's not that water hates the fats, it's just that water loves itself so much that it pushes the fats to the side. So water sticks to itself. The fats aren't polar. They don't have any charge. So it's like, it gets pushed to the side. So fats don't mix with the water. Yeah, so you, you see that with the oil slick on water. Now, you notice, of course, salt water it's really hard to freeze, really cold. You know, you can push away the water. But the deal is this, is that salt interferes with that lattice work. Those hydrogen bonds, you throw salts in it, it doesn't allow the hydrogens to line up. And so salty water doesn't freeze as easily. And of course, that's why we put salts on campus and on your sidewalks is because, honestly, you put salt on really cold ice, it does nothing, it just sits there. <clears throat> but as long as ice has a little bit of a water film on it, uh, the salt will dissolve in it and it won't refreeze. So uh, adding salt, uh, putting it on uh, a walk, uh, will keep the water from, from turning into ice. But it doesn't work at really cold temperatures. Yep. And that's what it does. Ice doesn't melt the snow. It simply keeps the ice from um, being able to form a solid crystal. That's all, it just gets in the way. So you don't have to use uh, salt. You can throw sugar out there too. Anything that's gonna dissolve is going to help it from freezing. And they do make actually stuff you put on the sidewalks that <clears throat> give off heat and will melt it. You know, that's the reactions. And interesting, like it just doesn't depend on what it is. Like I say, sugar can be anything. It depends on how many molecules. So actually calcium chloride 
is going to work a third better than calcium than sodium chloride. The sodium chloride is just going to dissolve into a sodium and a chloride. Calcium chloride is going to be calcium and two chlorides. That's three total. So that's all that matters is that uh, how many molecules are getting in the way of that ice, you know, forming that crystal. All right, I have to say, talk about this is that <clears throat> frogs like this great tree frog and our, uh, some more other frogs um, will freeze solid in the wintertime. Okay, that's not, not a big feat. But the amazing thing is they will thaw out. So you look up on YouTube, look at you know, freezing uh, frogs. You can see a time lapse. You can get a frog frozen, like solid frozen. And you thaw it out, what you'll see is that all of a sudden a finger will twitch and then it'll move and then the heart starts beating and it hops away. Isn't that amazing? Now, you try that with a person, you can freeze them. Bringing them back is the problem. Um, I actually remember as a kid, Mr. Science Guy came to grade school and he uh, had liquid nitrogen, which is wicked fun, right? But uh, he put a rose in there and smashed it. Ah, oh, cool. He put some goldfish in there. I mean, we would never do that today, you know, put, put a mouse in there, right? But he put goldfish in this liquid nitrogen that came out frozen and he threw one in a, a tank of water, aquarium. And he took another one, he hit a hammer and just shattered, you know? I can't believe they did that as a kid. I, I don't think I'm terribly affected by it, but it sounds pretty cruel. Um, and then as he's talking, that fish in the aquarium that was frozen solid starts waking up and starts swimming. But it like swim upside down, like it's brain. The problem is, is that with crystals in the brain tissue, it's going to the crystals, ice crystals are sharp and they break apart your cell membranes. The other big thing is, is that as water freezes, it sucks uh, sucks the, uh, the water out of the cells. It's going to shrink the cells because um, water freezes. But remember, well, pure water freezes and the, the sodium and potassium and chloride, that, that's going to remain out there. So as you take away the water, um, um, it becomes less water and osmosis is going to suck those things out of there. So yeah, the problems of shell, cell shrinkage and the crystals of water destroying the cells. That's why we can't freeze people. Although you can pay to have your body or just your head frozen and they will keep it for the future when we can figure out how to bring you back. You're saying who wants to just be a head, right? Well, we figure in the future they can put that head on another body. That's the idea. You laugh it off, right? <laughs> the person that has a frozen head is going to be laughing in the future if they can actually figure it out, right? But, you know, is, is it worth, you can look it up, hundreds of thousands of dollars for them that they say they're always going to keep your head frozen, you know. So, anyway, that's possible. And even more than uh, cryogenics of freezing yourself is be really useful to be able to freeze organs. Like, can you imagine a hospital that has a freezer filled with kidneys and hearts? What a huge improvement over having to, you know, get a donor heart put it in a cooler and rush it across the country and you have, it's a timed, right? Imagine if we could freeze them. We can't do that now, but we're really working a lot of research looking at what can we impregnate the tissue with so that allows it to be frozen and, and come back. But now that's, we can't do that, but the future we will. And how does a frog do it? And again, not all frog, bullfrog can't do it, but some frogs that live up north can do this and they, they freeze for a period of time they can't do it like for, for months, but they can freeze and come back if they, they freeze them. And what they do is they just wash their bodies with sugar. And you can look here that uh, stored sugar, you store it as glycogen in your liver, your muscles. It comes out as glucose. And, and this level of glucose in our blood would be deadly to us. But the frogs can take this high level of sugar. And so what happens is that this high level of sugar in the cells allows water outside the cells to freeze. So that extracellular fluid freezes and they can thaw and come back. You know, we couldn't stand this, it's like a diabetic, you know, you go in a coma if you're hyperglycemic like that. So we can't do that, but uh, the frogs can, can, can handle it. Um, and again, more than freezing people, because you know, how are we gonna freeze? No one's gonna die, I'm gonna freeze them. I mean, but organs would be great to be able to freeze and then just thaw out and give to someone. And I'll give you an even a better idea, is that we make new organs from our stem cells. That will be the future. Forget about a donor organ you could reject. Just get some stem cells, grow a new heart in the lab. You can even switch out hearts, you know, every 20 years or something like that too. So that's the future. I mean, it's not sound science fiction, but 
It's, it's coming in your lifetime, maybe mine. All right, so let's move on. Let's, now we're gonna finish this lecture, the chemistry of talking about the ones that are really important here to A and P, all right? So y'all are familiar with your carbs. A lot of you at athletic and health, uh, you, you know about carbs, lipids are the fats, proteins, you know, right? And then nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. So let's get to it. So what are these, proteins? All right, there is some protein, but for those of you, I'm sorry, like on an Atkins diet or low carbs, this is like, this is hell looking at all these great bread and pasta, right? But uh, our carbs really give us uh, our energy. <clears throat> That's where we, uh, we break down sugars and starches so we get most of our energy. So yeah, there's a lot of talk about carbs, uh, some idea of a low carb diet or a high carb diet or I'll talk about carbo-loading, things like that. But carbohydrates are, um, yeah, organic molecule, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Usually, you know, C6H12O6, they're in that uh, uh, two to one ratio, makes a carb, but um, includes simple carbs like sugars and then complex carbs like starches, right? But we use that energy. Our main energy is glucose, this molecule here. And you can see the, the gray balls are carbons, the reds are oxygens, and the little ones are hydrogens. And uh, we break the energy in these bonds slowly to harvest the energy. And in each one of these carbons becomes carbon dioxide that bubbles out, we breathe out. So when we, I can almost feel the, the heat from this, this heat is the breaking of those bonds really rapidly by adding, you know, a spark and oxygen. We can, we can burn, this tree took all this time to take carbon dioxide from the air and minerals and, and oxygen, uh, or carbon dioxide to make these molecules and then we just burn them, it releases the energy. So monosaccharides are simple sugars and uh, you think about glucose, is the one we use in our, our bodies a lot. We don't eat a lot of glucose directly. Fructose from fruit. I'll show you some pictures here. So these three isomers, no, oh, don't, I'm not getting into the chemistry, but look at these. They have the same molecular formula. It's almost like, you know, looking at these, which one of these is different and how, you know, find the differences. But there are, you know, subtle differences here in the configuration of the bonds, cis or trans, what direction they're going. Um, so yeah, uh, galactose, uh, fructose, glucose, these are simple sugars that we can take in or we break down our starches to make these and then uh, uh, we burn these in our mitochondria to get uh, ATP, our energy. Yeah, and so glucose is the big one. It's the one we use most easily, most readily to get our energy. And uh, this energy is what we use for all of our chemical reactions, our muscles, our thinking, everything, right? And any extra glucose we get, we store it, right? We can store it uh, short term as glycogen. Glycogen is a long string of glucose. So it's a polysaccharide. It's a long string, a polymer of simple sugars. And we store this in our muscles and our liver. And between meals, we break it down and we use that glucose. And if we got too much even for glycogen, we can convert it into fats and store that in our fat. So you should know what carbo-loading is, and it's real. Um, some of these, I talk about eating an alkaline diet or something like that. Carbo-loading is real. And if you want to, to perform well in a, <clears throat> a really aerobic activity, like a, a marathon or biking or something like that, um, what you can do is the following. It's not like, again, I'm an office fan. It's not like Michael Scott's eating a big plate of pasta Alfredo just before the race, right? No, 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 that's just gonna make you nothing, right? But real carbo-loading is when um, you, uh, you deplete your body of carbs. You don't eat any carbs like a week. You just eat you know, chicken breast, fish, just uh, don't do that. What your body does is that it's kind of starved for these, this glycogen. And then just before, like the night before, you eat a lot of carbs, big pasta dinner, bread. And what your body does is it rebounds a little bit from the normal glycogen level. It kind of like overreacts and stores a bunch of it. And then if you hit that, that point and then you go out and do your competition, you've got more stored glycogen and you can, you can count on that to help you. So carbo-loading uh, uh, is real. Yes, so 
you know, you know, simple sugars, these monosaccharides like the glucose and the fructose from eating a piece of fruit, um, you can use that immediately and, and, and as energy. <clears throat> Complex carbs, when you add them together, so a disaccharide like our table sugar or a polysaccharide like that glycogen that we store or a starch. Um, those are complex carbs <clears throat> that it takes a little more time, a little more time release energy because we've got to break all those bonds before we can absorb it into our blood. So indeed, plants store it as a, one way they store it is as starch. Plants store their energy as starch. Um, we store it as glycogen. So if you eat a steak, you're getting polysaccharide is going to be glycogen. If you eat a bagel, you're going to get starch. They're similar. They're both strings of sugar. Um, they store it differently. And so we get our starch and our pasta and our breads from uh, harvesting uh, plants, usually the germ of a seed. Now there's a couple of polysaccharides we can't digest because we just don't have the, the enzyme. It's weird because cellulose is the most, probably the most common polysaccharide on the planet. All plants use cellulose for um, their structure. I mean, potatoes will store starch and we'll use that, but cellulose is what makes up the strings and celery. Uh, it's uh, the basis of uh, uh, when you eat a salad, uh, you get the water out of the lettuce and you get uh, some nutrients and water. I said, well, yeah, but um, the, most of the cell, the cell walls are made out of cellulose and we don't have cellulase. No vertebrates do. We can't break it down. Um, things like uh, termites, they also can't break down the, cell, the lignin and cellulose and and wood, but they have uh, symbiotic gut uh, uh, microbes that can. And in our guts, we've got E. coli and bacteria that can break down the cellulose, but we don't have the enzyme to break it down. Strange, huh? And one more. So uh, cellulose, damn, it looks like it's got a lot of sugar in it. It does. But we just don't have the right enzyme to fit into it to break it apart. So it will go through us, except our bacteria can break it down and give us some energy. Another one is chitin. Uh, chitin makes up the shells of insects and crustaceans like lobster and shrimp. And so chitin is another polysaccharide that we just don't have the enzyme for. So it just goes through us. Yeah. The ones we can use are starch and glycogen. Those are polysaccharides that are, we have enzymes to break down and we can release each one of those packets of sugar. The other two we can't. All right, you all know, if you want an instant uh, sugar rush, you know, go ahead and uh, have some, uh, some pure sugar, right? Uh, if you want it to be more released, you have complex carbs, only because there's a time lag, because you got to break down each one of these uh, bonds to release the simple sugars. Yeah. And that, uh, that cellulose, that chitin, any indigestible, we call it fiber or bulk. And it's important in our diet, it keeps things moving. We do the digestive system, uh, gets rid of some cholesterol with it. Um, um, so the fiber is the stuff that we can't digest, it gets through us. All right, so carbs. Carbs include sugars and starches and a good source of energy. Lipids, actually lipids per weight hold about twice as much energy as the proteins or the carbs. And we use lipids um, to store energy uh, and also as padding and as insulation as well. The lipids are, are, are molecules that are hydrophobic. So um, fats and water don't mix. And so all of our cell membranes are made out of fat. So it's interesting, we're gonna see which can get through it. Things that dissolve in fat can get through it easily, but a polar molecule is hydrophobic, it can't get through it. So when we talk about lipids, um, a lot of our fats, triglycerides, you know, a lot of fat we get from our diet, but also all of our cells are made out of fat, all the cell membranes, these phospholipids. So fatty tail with this phosphate head, wicked important for life, right? And then uh, steroid hormones. We'll look at estrogen, testosterone, um, cholesterol. These are things that are sterols that are also fats. So yeah, you, if you were to cut a section, transverse section through a seal, you would see 
tons of fat and then the body in the middle. So they're living in cold water. It's going to be a good way to insulate yourself from the temperature and to store a lot of energy. And humans are very fatty. You uh, have seen a dissection of a, um, you know, a jaguar or something like that. They're just so lean, you know. Um, but you, uh, you hunters in Maine that have uh, skinned a bear uh, after winter or before winter, you see tons of this white fat. And so humans too, fat fills up in our eye sockets, our armpits, under our skin, on our organs. So this fat is a good place to store energy. But of course, obesity today is a big issue too. Um, we have an abundance of food and uh, we're less active. So looking at a fat, look at these tails. These tails, these are all carbons with hydrogens. And each one of these bonds stores energy. And overall, you have a glycerol head and these fatty uh, acid tails. It's a triglyceride, but it's the most common. You see it drawn like this with these three tails. And uh, um, this, the, the length of the tail, where there's double bonds, there's a whole different varieties of fats. This is your basic triglyceride. Uh, the glycerol head, you can see that with the uh, oxygens on it. And the tails are just tails of carbons and hydrogens, holding lots of energy. Yeah, and um, we like the taste of fats. Um, and it's not, it's, it's unfortunately, it's, in our it's in our dna it is it is in our minds we have evolved to like fats and sugars because by liking fats it allowed us to survive when there was you know not as buffets and you know and vending machines filled with uh, you know cheetos um it allowed us to survive and have more babies and those individuals that didn't like fats that liked eating sticks or things like that without much energy those genes didn't get passed on. The genes that got passed on were the humans that recognized that fatty grubs and, and seeds, fat, um, they liked to eat it. Therefore, they survived those periods where there wasn't much food. And you can't have babies if you've got no body fat either. So you'll even more young. And so we have evolved to like fat, to like sugar, because it has calories. Um, and so it's just in us. It's not like we have this preference because our parents taught us this or something like that. And I'll show you a, a graph where sweets, like we enjoy the taste of sweet things, and it actually comes, it seems to be too sweet. But fatty things just tends, the more fatty, if we could just chew on butter, I, I guess I don't like that either. But um, there's really, a, a, we enjoy those chips with fat in it and uh, those french fries because it gives us pleasure in our brains. All right. uh, you should know the difference here and a lot of you are getting interested in, in health so as you understand a saturated versus unsaturated but to make sure we all got it. A saturated fat means that um, all the there's no double bonds that if you look at these tails each one of these is a carbon right remember carbon likes four electrons to share, you can see it's got two hydrogens, the two carbons, it's filled like that. An unsaturated fat is missing a hydrogen. So what it has to do is make a double bond, right? So that carbon still has four electrons it's sharing. What does that do for it? The double bond, who cares? Well, that double bond causes the kink, the tail kinks in that region. Yeah, and so what happens is that, uh, you it's less dense because the tails can't be packed in. Imagine you've got a, a big pallet filled with two by fours, like you see at Home Depot or something like that. If they're not bench, you can they're dense, they're stacked together. If they're warped, all of a sudden whoosh, it's gonna take up a lot more space because you can't pack them together, right? So saturated fats like lard and butter are often solid at room temperature. Whereas an unsaturated fat like, like olive oil, or something like that, is gonna be a liquid at room temperature. Yeah, yeah, cool. And actually, coconut oil, if it's warm, it's going to be liquid. When it gets cold, it turns solid, you know? Or you think about, like, you make a, uh, a steak late at night, and you don't clean the pan. You leave it on the stove, right? In the morning, it's got that white solid fat, right? So that's a saturated fat you see, like, in, uh, in, in beef. But olive oil will stay liquid all the time because um, uh, uh, the, the lard... Uh, and cheeses and, and animal fat can be 
put together because those tails are straight. They're not all kinky to the side. And health considerations, unsaturated fats have been found to cause less heart disease. So you tend to go away from the butter and the, and the, and the lard and more towards the, the avocado or the, 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 some of the plant oils. Yeah, but saturated fat tastes pretty good. Uh, I mean, food scientists look and they manipulate fats in order to have the best mouthfeel, the best taste and uh, the most best storage things. So I don't know if you've ever made chocolate chip cookies late at night, let's just say, and let's say you're like, oh, I got this. I, I got butter, I got the egg, I got the mix. You put the mix in, you put the egg in, you go for that butter. Oh, damn, there's no butter. You're like, oh, I need these cookies. I need these cookies. And so you, uh, well, I, I got olive oil. It's not really, it's about the same. You try it. What are those cookies like? All right, they're still good, but they're not as good because they kind of spread out and they're crispy. They're not chewy, you know what I mean? So, so fats, food scientists use fats in order to, to make the proper mouthfeel. So it melts in body temperature and not at room temperature kind of thing. Yeah. And they manipulate it such that you can take a nice, healthy, unsaturated fat and you can bubble hydrogen through it to make hydrogenated oils that are less healthy, but you can manipulate it so it's just the right fat for your Twinkie or whatever you're making, right? And what they used to make when they did this were some trans fats would come about. And now they, they've been banned because they were really linked to, to heart disease. And so you won't see those in America. I think they're banned by now. All right, one more thing just to talk about fats because we enjoy them so much, but we know you know, and that they, uh, they lead to obesity and such if you have too many fats. Um, so how could you, you want to be rich, you make a fat that you don't gain weight from, that you can't absorb. And they actually came up with one called Olestra. You guys are too young to probably hear this one. It's around still. Um, but the issue, this is what it looked like. Yeah, so it kind of looks like a fat, it's got a long tail, right? But kind of like a medusa, you know, going every direction instead of being parallel. Um, the issue with this, it did taste good, but they would have to put on the packaging, may cause anal leakage. And that, nothing sells food more than putting that on it, right? So, um, um, yeah, I, I might, you can still get it. And honestly, it doesn't cause any problems unless you eat a lot of it. So we still don't have that perfect fat that tastes good, but goes through you. And well, goes through you responsibly. All right, so fats, they have the most calories per weight. So we, we enjoy them because our ancestors that survived enjoyed them. And they're long hydrocarbon tails that contain all that energy. Some other uh, lipids that are not fats um, are things like the sterols. This, this is the basic cholesterol. And you keep thinking cholesterol is bad, but you need it. All the animal cells have cholesterol in all the cell membranes. So you need a certain amount of it. We just know that too much cholesterol is, is, goes on our arteries. So here's the basic cholesterol. You have these, uh, these four uh, rings. And from cholesterol, which again, all of our animal cell membranes have it. Plant cell membranes don't, but animals do. And uh, we make uh, certain important steroid hormones, cortisol, uh, aldosterone, estrogen, testosterone, these things. Look how similar estrogen and, progest and testosterone are, right? The difference between men and women, we're talking about just a few molecules here. Look at that, missing a hydrogen there, a couple here. Uh, that's fake, but uh, we'll talk about, uh, when we do hormones, we'll talk about uh, abuse of, of uh, certain hormones, but um, estrogen and testosterone uh, come from, uh, we need cholesterol to make them. All right, phospholipids make up our cell membranes. Here is the lipid tails, and then the phosphate part is hydrophilic, it's charged, so it's towards the water. And then waxes, you know, you wax your skis or something like that. They wax vegetables in the grocery stores, so they don't lose water, but you know they're very hydrophobic. And again, phospholipids, so important to, 
physiology. This is what our, our, our membranes of all of our cells are made of. <clears throat> so you can see that this phosphate group and the fatty tails down here. And so when you put them into water, they line up. All the tails stick together because they hate the water. They don't hate the water, but the water hate. The water loves itself that it pushes them together. Yeah, so notice this, phospholipids, the heads will all be in the water, the tails will all be in the oil part of it. And so that's how the first cells probably evolved. You throw phospholipids in water, they actually make these cells. Now they're not alive, but they make a, a hollow centered cell because all the tails go to the inside. Yeah. All right, so lipids, lots of energy. They don't mix with water and uh, they include our fats and also phospholipids and steroid hormones. All right, proteins. Proteins are the most diverse class of uh, organic molecules. In fact, when they were looking for, uh, before the 1950s, when they figured out that DNA was our genetic material, it was thought that they were, proteins would be a good suspect because DNA is so simple. It just has four, varies with four letters. Proteins have so much complexity. They thought they must hold the key, but they don't. Proteins make up our, our muscle, our skin, our hair, our, our enzymes, our poisons, our, uh, uh, our hormones, most of them, all these things. Uh, proteins, they make up so many. There's so many kinds of proteins, like 200,000 proteins in our, that make up our diversity of, of our bodies, really. Fats and carbs are pretty simple in comparison. So yeah, 200,000 types. You guys know how many genes you have? It's like 20,000. So like, wait a minute, one gene makes a protein, right? Well, you can have varieties with some uh, post-translational modifications. You can have, you can modify things after you uh, um, transcribe it. So. I know, let's not get into that too much, but you can see almost a quarter million types of proteins in our bodies. All these enzymes, you're lactose intolerant, you don't make lactase properly. Uh, all these enzymes, hormones, hemoglobin, insulin, our muscles are made out of protein, uh, our hair, our, oh my God, our cartilage. Yeah, all these proteins on our cell surfaces. Yeah. So what makes up a protein? It's made out of amino acids. Now, amino, we're talking about nitrogen. So you have an amino group, and then this carboxyl group, and then this is the rest of the molecule. So uh, you're gonna have this portion of it, and then the, the amino acid there is gonna vary. We have various kinds of amino acids, and they vary. And you put them together, amino acids, you make a protein. So proteins, their shape is so important, the shape of them. Yep, and so we're gonna talk about the primary structure is just like a, uh, a necklace with the beads on it. It's just gonna be what amino acids are put together in what order. It's gonna be your primary structure. And that's completely based on your genes, right? Remember, oh my God, right? We'll talk about that too, but your DNA is gonna code for genes and you're gonna read it in triplets to say what amino acid goes in order. That's your primary structure. But you put this long bead necklace in water, it's gonna fold on each other. And that'll be the secondary structure. It'll kind of have pleats or it'll fold or twist. And then tertiary structure, we have big pieces of it coming together. And there's even a quantitary structure. We can have several strings bound together. So it comes out, it's born uh, off of a ribosome as this polypeptide, this string of, uh, amino acids, but then it's going to change shape into the mature protein that does the stuff, does the actions. So the sequence, these are uh, peptide bonds bonding these amino acids together. Uh, so secondary, a lot of it is hydrogen bonding, and you got this sort of beta pleated sheet and this helical structure, but, but the water and the, the bonding with each other is going to cause it to Give it a structure beyond the basic just beads. Uh, tertiary is you're going to have more complex folding here. You're going to have sulfur is going to interact and hydrogen bonding is going to interact 
and you're gonna have a more complex structure with this tertiary structure. And not all proteins, but some proteins like hemoglobin is gonna be made up of several different chains that come together. And that'll give you this quantitary structure. So we're talking about the shape is so critically important and it's caused by this folding and the structure, right? Think about an enzyme like uh, lactase that breaks down your lactose sugar. It's gotta be just the right shape to fit that sugar, right? If it's wonky, it's not gonna work. So that's why it's so important to get the shape right. And um, you can screw up proteins by uh, heating them up, right? Cook an egg, you've just changed the protein structure. And humans, if we get too high a temperature, up 105 you know, Fahrenheit, you're gonna cook those proteins. You're gonna denature them. There's no coming back, you're dead. Um, also, you can use chemicals like pH. You can put a, um, you can soak an egg in vinegar and it will cook it. Or ceviche, I love that. You put a, a shrimp or some fish and lime juice and it will cook it uh, in that. Or you can beat it up. You can make a meringue by just taking eggs and sugar and just beat the hell out of it. And you're gonna change the protein structure. So the protein, the, that complex structure is delicate and you can physically beat it up, chemically beat it up or heat it up and you will change the structure of the protein. Look at that. And when you denature it, which means you ruin that complex structure, game over, right? Um, it usually doesn't go back. You can't unfry that egg. And your hair is a protein too. And you know, you get a perm, you smell that sulfur, you know, from the chemicals. And uh, it's actually, so you can chemically treat hair. And some of it is genetic, the way the hair comes out, whether it's curly or straight too. But uh, definitely some of it is these bonds in the keratin that give you straight versus curly hair. And big thing, of course, in physiology is enzymes. Enzymes speed up reactions, right? They catalyze or speed them up. We would die instantly if our, we didn't have enzymes because those chemical reactions would happen just way too slow. So all these different enzymes are making all these reactions happen in us. And again, the enzyme itself is not used up. It's just recycled again and again. It's used to make a reaction happen. It can put things together. It can break things apart. But it's just by the shape of it, it brings the molecules together and it puts them in the right configuration to encourage that reaction, put it together, break it apart. So the enzyme is like a matchmaker. It takes two individuals and puts them together really quickly and it's reused thousands of times a second to reuse these enzymes. And here's an enzyme that um, is working correctly. It's taking lactose sugar and it fits in perfectly. And then when they sink in there, that uh, protein changes shape and it bends that bond and breaks them apart and allows you to digest that sugar. If your genes are such that you, you have maybe one letter difference and you put the wrong amino acid in there and the protein's the wrong shape, that lactase, the lactose will never fit in there and you can't break it down. And your bacteria do and you get gas and pain, things like that, so. All right, so that is proteins. They make up your muscles, your, your enzymes, your, your hair, your, uh, you know, proteins are incredibly complex. We'll see things like insulin are made up of thousands of amino acids. You can have simple proteins too, but some are really big and complex. All right, lastly, we'll talk about nucleic acids. We're talking about DNA and RNA. And just big review, you guys have had this in general biology, right? But um, when you look at the structure, you know, you got this phosphate group, the sugar, and then you have the nitrogenous bases, the ATCG or U and RNA. So you have these nitrogen containing bases, and we talk about, we use those letters, right? A and T and C and G go together, right? So you have this uh, sugar phosphate that is going to be the sides of the ladder, and they're connected by covalent bonds, nice and strong. And out of it come these bases, right? And, um, and that'll be single-stranded. And if you put another strand, they'll come together and hydrogen bonds will hold these bases together in the center. 
but we can unzip them, right? This is all review, right? So a nucleotide is uh, the monomer, if you will, and a polymer is if you put a bunch together to make a, a nucleic acid. So a nucleotide includes the phosphate, sugar, and a base. And uh, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA is uh, ribonucleic acid. And they're gonna, they differ in three ways that I will tell you that you need to know. Yeah. So this DNA, like I say, it's not an incredibly diverse molecule. It has these four letters that change it. And it doesn't, the chemistry doesn't matter. It's the information that matters. Just like our language. Um, we have 26 letters and uh, it's how you put them together. Right? So God, dog, same letters, but the, the configuration matters, right? And um, so we have these letters that give us information. It's so cool. And humans, we use 26 in our alphabet. We only use four in our DNA. It doesn't matter. Computers use two, binary, one or zero. And that holds your freaking movie with the surround sound and all the colors, right? So you can hold a lot of information just using, you know, two letters. But we use four. And in our language, you use 26. Oh. And so this holds our genetic information. We have three and a half billion letters in our DNA. Most of that's junk, but the genes within it code for all of our proteins, which give me blue eyes and maybe you brown eyes or green eyes. It's all in the, in the genes there. And you can see right here, these little dotted lines, those are hydrogen bonds. We're talking about chemistry here. So it's pretty weak but all of them together keeps those two strands together. Yep. Cool. So you know it's a double helix, all right? You all know that. You know, I could test you on this. A goes with T, C goes with G. One's a pyridine, one's a purine. So I see two always goes with one so that the latter doesn't go out. It goes straight because two always goes with one. All right, so RNA. RNA, we use RNA to make a copy of our DNA, a temporary copy to come out to make the proteins. So it's like, if you don't wanna bring out grandma's cookbook, it's too delicate, you, you go in, you copy the recipe on an index card, and in the kitchen you can get it dirty and rip it, it doesn't matter, because you still have that original DNA <clears throat> held in the nucleus. So RNA, the deal is it has a U instead of a T. Uracylversystiamine. Again, I don't know why, but it just does, and you need to know it. It also only has a single strand, one backbone. It doesn't have two sides, like DNA. And then the sugar, uh, deoxyribose versus ribose, is different. Extra oxygen in the, in the RNA. All right. And what we do is we take the DNA, which we only keep in our nucleus. It's in all our cells, except red blood cells don't have a nucleus, they don't have it. Um, and then we, we read, we copy or transcribe one of these strands to make RNA, which is gonna have that information. And then we modify it a bit. We'll like edit some parts out. Remember introns and exons, exons. We'll, we'll do that, we'll put a cap and a tail on it. And, and eventually we'll make this messenger RNA that is going to code for the protein. It's gonna say, what amino acids do we put on that protein? Cool, all right, we're at the end. Long lectures here. And again, a lot of this should, this all should be review, but I, I wanna review it. I make sure we're all in the same, the same place. Uh, this, I'll use this in nutrition too. I talk about that next semester, but someone took a picture of what they ate every day, all their meals for three months. A lot of pie, a lot of pie. Nobody's gonna eat so much pie these days, do we? Probably good, right? But the point here is that all of this diet that we eat is all broken down into the molecules, the fats, the carbs, the nucleic acids, and the proteins. And that needs to be absorbed into our bloodstream. And then our bodies take those building blocks and make us and burn it for energy and allow us to grow and to, to, be, uh, to do everything that we do. All right, at the end of the PowerPoint here, I, I just I copied from the, um, um, 
uh, from your book, the outline. So it helps you to study. You can cut and paste this, you make it a study guide or, or whatever. You can get it from your book too. All right, a lot of lecturing on chemistry. Honestly, I'm gonna get more excited. I'll just share between you and me when we get to uh, start talking about skin, I'll talk about bones and muscles, but uh, we gotta get through this chemistry. Then we'll talk about histology and cell biology and the cell physiology. This will be for our first test. So our first exam includes a lot of what seems like introductory material and things that we're kind of reviewing, but uh, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do the first section uh, a lot, but hopefully a lot of it is review. So you guys can just organize it in your head, uh, look up things maybe that you, you weren't sure about um, uh, to make you ready for that. All right, class, I'm doing this uh, Sunday, so I'm gonna see a lot of you tomorrow. All right, we are done.